broadcasting to the live airwaves of my Twitter account, my Periscope account. And for those listening after the fact on any audio streaming device that you may or may not have, this is the bottom line episode number. Let's get that on the screen here. Episode number 72 and another big one. Episode number 35 of the MMA rendition of this program. AJ Shula once again joining me. He's got his DraftKings shirt all set up. He's got the headphones donned in, and it looks like a new microphone. My friend, what technological advancements have you made to kind of step up this game this weekend? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on again. Uh, really stepped up my my game here. Thanks to you. You pointed out some suggestions here. Added out this uh, this little mic here that I use for podcasting. I didn't really think. I didn't know why I didn't go here when I was doing these going on camera here and whatnot. And so obviously I added some headphones as well. So I'm upgrading technologically and uh, thank God the viewers will be able to hear me a lot better. Yeah. Well, you sound great. At least right now. How do I sound? I sound good. I didn't sound, even do any type of mic checks. No, I sound terrible. <laughs> no. no, not at all. Well, man, we got a phenomenal card that we're going to break down for this weekend. This is going to be a preview um, of blades and Volkov coming up for this weekend and we'll go ahead and get this card up on the screen here there's a lot to like here on this main card and rightfully so you know it feels like curtis blades has been in a million big either main or co-main events now feels like a lifetime ago where he really took a step up onto that co-main event aura and took on mark uh mark hunt a fight that they were replaying on fight pass earlier this week i guess my first question to you is before we kind of you know, should probably touch in postmortem on last Saturday's fights a little bit, but just to kind of get the main event fresh into people's minds as we start off here, and a phenomenal one at that this weekend with, between Curtis Razorblades and Alexander Drago Volkov. It, looking at the diagnostics and seeing everything kind of play out on film for you, it, what, what is really your X factor as far as, you know, between either of these guys? What have you noticed before anything else that could really give one of these two guys in the, in the marquee a leg up on the other? Uh, yeah, um, it's pretty indicative in the odds, but before researching this fight, I, I thought that you would think that the odds would be a lot comp more competitive than they are based off the fact that these are two top 10 heavyweights. They've certainly proven themselves inside the UFC's octagon with several uh, good wins over high-level fighters. But after looking at it on tape, I have to say to your question, the X factor is certainly the grappling here. Uh, you look at Volkov's losses and, and the grappling susceptibility is very, very evident in, in the majority of his losses. You know, even some fights where he's won, such as like the Fabricio Verdun fight, he struggled early on. And even like other fights as well, like Timothy Johnson and Roy Nelson, he struggled early on because of the grappling, but was able to win those fights due to other reasons, but also the opposition gassed. But this fight is a little bit different because adding on to that X factor, we got Curtis Blades here, who has shown excellent cardio inside the UFC's octagon. And I have to attribute that to the fact that he's a very good athlete, hardworking guy, trains at Denver, Colorado altitude. And while this is his first uh, fight that could potentially go past the third round, this isn't his first, kind of what we said last week with uh, Jessica, I, this isn't his first uh, five round preparation in terms of training camp because he did prepare uh, to go five rounds with not just Junior Dos Santos, but also Francis Ngannou the second time. So the X factor to me would be the cardio with blades, but also the fact that he adds that that grappling uh, vulnerability that Volkov has shown in the past. You know, Blades too kind of is in an interesting spot, is he not? With two losses to Ngannou, obviously there's no shame in losing to Francis Ngannou, but to be in that kind of number one contender area that he's kind of been trending towards as of recent, and to have those two losses against maybe the only guy that's trending more certainly in that number one contender area, it'll be a it'll be an interesting scenario uh, and one that we'll touch on here momentarily. Last bit of housekeeping before we get into last weekend. If you are watching this on YouTube, listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, which uh, whatever may have you, and you like content like this, go ahead, hit like, go ahead, hit subscribe. We over here at the program do appreciate it. Really quickly, though, I do want to touch on last weekend's card. I had a big takeaway from the main event as we kind of try to pull this up here. And with Jessica I and Cynthia Calvillo. Calvillo being, you know, kind of the dominant the dominant party between the two over the course of 25 minutes. I thought, it, or at least my pick going into the fight was Calvillo by submission. I thought Calvillo would get the job done. However, coming out of it, I'm just going to come out and say it. I, I think that there are problems that are presented to Cynthia Calvillo in this weight class. You agree, disagree? What say you? Uh, Jessica, 
or not Jessica, I Cynthia Calvillo at 125 pounds going forward. You have what type of impression based off of what we saw last Saturday? Um, going forward, it's it's going to be tough because she's in a spot like we talked about last week, where a win over Jessica I would would put her. I don't, I didn't see the UFC's official rankings, but I'd imagine she's either number one or number two. But she's in a spot where it's like you you could argue she's next in line for the title. We also also mentioned Joanne Calderwood last week, but the also interesting thing about that is she has a win over Joanne Calderwood. It was at strawweight and it was a couple years ago, but she still has a win over her, and so she's right. in the spot right now where basically. It's like, who does she have left to fight that she hasn't yet? That's an elite fighter in this weight class that's ranked above her. That's the champion, Valentina Shevchenko. So, uh, obviously, Calvillo is- clocks in at number two right here. Number two. Okay. Right and- behind Chukagian, who called her out. And I'm, I'm not going to lie either. I kind of like Caitlin Chukagian in that fight. What say you? I think that's an interesting one. Obviously, I would have to tape study it, but that actually makes a ton of sense to me. Now that you do mention it, I do remember Chikagan. I believe she tweeted it out that she said, like, gimme, gimme or something like that. But uh, I think that makes a lot of sense because, yeah, like to get – no matter how much we, we like Calvillo, like to, to move up a weight class and then win and then get a, a, a immediate title shot kind of seems like a little bit of a reach. So I think you could do Calderwood versus Shevchenko, and then you could have Chikagan versus Calvillo. As far as how she would fare there, I mean, I still uh, do think that Chikagan, while she is a very good uh, pure submission grappler training at, at Hanzo Gracie, and she, obviously she held that in her last fight. I was really happy to see her go for takedowns there. Um, that defensive wrestling thing is still going to always be in the back of my mind with Chikagan because if there is something about her game that um, she can improve, it's definitely that. Obviously, she's, she's super sharp, very well-rounded, but uh, that would be an interesting dynamic of uh, Calvillo – I was pretty impressed with how she looked takedown wise against I. She, I mean, she that that told me something that she was a lot more efficient in that work she did at AK right. paid dividends. But uh, you're right. Here, strike. if I could, if I could step in, yeah. If you're about to mention something striking wise, if I could step in about the striking aspect of it, and I got the numbers right here, 113 to 70 in total strikes landed you know the output i wouldn't say is necessarily a problem the efficiency i wouldn't say is necessarily a problem but she wasn't moving jessica really off the center line terribly too much i didn't feel like her punches were doing a whole lot of damage when she was landing on the feet because she was landing don't get me wrong especially on those twos and threes from her combinations that's something that i noticed consistently was that she was landing and wasn't really doing a whole lot. You got any problems with that premise from me? Call no, me I, out, bro. Call me out. No, no, Let's no. Hear it. <laughs> You're right. She, she's never been known as a power puncher. So if you if you want yeah. to add something else, that yeah, then right. yeah, you're definitely on the right track. Absolutely. Yeah, and and that kind of bothers me in this weight class, is what I'm saying. I mean, there are going there are going to be bigger girls than Jessica in this weight class. We have to remember, you know, Jessica while having issues of her own getting down to 125, especially as of recent. And, you know, what's next for her as a result of said weight cutting issues? Who knows? But at this point, Cynthia Calvillo may have damn near walked herself into a title shot once Joanne Calderwood is done. You seem to have a problem with that premise. I do too. I think she needs another win. But what do you think the probability is that the UFC gives her a shot at at Shevchenko in Um her next fight? I, I think based off the rankings that you just showed me, I think they probably would give her Chikagan. And based off the fact that uh, Chikagan wants it, I don't see why Calvillo would turn it down either. So, yeah. And, um, you know, obviously they, they tried to book that Calderwood fight, but then Shevchenko was injured. And, and we have a situation here where it's like if the two were to match up, uh, one takeaway that I noted in that fight, Calvillo versus I, that I pointed out my breakdown, and I actually thought it was going to be a pretty compelling factor, was the kicks of Calvillo. But, I mean, we're looking yeah. at the numbers here. But I, I recall from, like, a visual perspective, she wasn't kicking as much as I thought she would. And she wasn't moving on the outside as much as I thought she was. She was a lot more comfortable po- boxing in the pocket, which is, which is good. It, it tells me she's improving and more comfortable there. But also, um, if she were to get matched up against a Chukagan who – is a very technical striker, uh, very good, uh, very good footwork and movement. That could, to your point, pose problems because we know how talented Chikagan is. And if she wants to play that game with her on the feet, that's definitely a spot where uh, Chikagan could win. Obviously, I need to tape study that matchup, but clearly uh, Chikagan is live in that circumstance. 
Live indeed. And was there another performance, you know, before we really hit this main card uh, this weekend hard, was there any other performance from last weekend? I mean, I, I kind of expected what we saw out of Marvin Vittori. I was kind of cautiously impressed with Charles Rosa. I thought he came on hard towards the end. Jordan Espinosa really made us put our foots in our mouths because I know you were high on Mark De La Rosa, as was I. Um, Agapova had to be the one, at least on the main card, that really was the wow factor for me. You had to like the three the three um, fighters coming off bang, bang, bang on, on the prelims, but was there any one in particular that stood out to you as well? Uh, I was impressed with a lot of these performances, but if you're asking me one that I think kind of flew under the radar was Charles Jourdain. Um, despite the fact that he lost, I thought he fought very valiantly, and he showed me he, I, and this sounds kind of bold because he lost this fight against Feely, but won against Choi. But I thought he looked better here against Feely than than the Choi fight because he showed a lot more composure. Like the guy is very talented. He hits hard. Obviously, he dropped Feely in that first round. He's How many very- kicks do you think these two guys threw in that fight too? There were so many kicks from like being thrown back and forth between both of those guys. I thought that was a fun fight. I, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count, but uh, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> What, what impressed me there was j- just the composure because if he shows that composure and I did notice improvements with the other part of his game and where he's at youth wise, cause the guy's still very young. I do think he's that guy that could potentially crack the top 15. So while, while I could go off, uh, note something with each fight here, I was impressed with him kind of like as a sneaky play, but yeah, you, you said Rosa, Vittoria, obviously Espinosa. I, yeah, I lost that bet there. Agapova looked great. Yeah, it was just a, a great card. I mean, it really was. Yeah, and you know, you get we we hear this narrative all the time. It's always the ones that you kind of go eh, at on paper that end up delivering, and that you know, you have that record breaking kind of start. The first three cards or the first three fights on the card all being on, over and under a minute. Uh, you'd have to imagine performances such as like Julia Avila will probably get her uh, a fight in the top fifteen in her neck of the woods as of next. However, we move forward and we have a hell of a main event to talk about this weekend. And it's always fun when the heavyweights get in there and lock horns uh, for whatever reason, regardless. So Curtis blades, as we kind of mentioned earlier is in kind of that interesting spot where he and Volkov kind of are the de facto number one contender to be is in regards to whoever walks out of this as the winner with Francis Ngannou being the rightful number one contender as of right now. Interesting times at heavyweight, and we're going to hammer that home, obviously, but just stylistically, this is a fun matchup. Volkov has really won almost every single second he's spent inside the octagon outside of that final, you know, final guns blazing laps that he had against Derek Lewis. Outside of that, he's come up with big wins. He's been in main events, um, taking out, you know, guys like Stefan Struve, finishing guys like Fabricio Verdum in what I thought was one of the better performances of his tenure and really had a bunch of, a whole slew of solid performances in Bellator too. You know, you kind of peel the onion back here a little bit, you know, same reach, the height difference is, is imperative here with Alexander Volkov. You would have to imagine blades would be one to maybe set up the offensive grappling attack early maybe wear him down on the feet. It's interesting to kind of, you know, forecast what Curtis blades can do with this type of matchup, like Volkov in front of him. Yeah. um, I went for on for over 10 minutes, breaking down this fight, but concisely, I'll just say that. Yeah. I mean, he should look for the takedown when he can. I've noticed improvements with Curtis. He's doing a lot better job of setting up his takedowns via feints, you know, faking going up high and, and dropping low. He's also catching fighters off guard because of his threat of the level change like he did against Justin Willis, and he, he dropped him with a big shot. Uh, Curtis is really good. He's improving, and I have to attribute that because he's been doing a lot of work, obviously a team elevation, but a, a heavyweight that's there that is helping is Alistair Overeem, and I Overeem has an abundance of experience that you know he could teach anybody, and I think working with him is going to pay big dividends with, with the body of work that Curtis has, and yeah, Volkov, it's um he basically needs to get open space here and and hurt curtis i think it's it's not impossible obviously this is heavyweight but the thing that sticks out to me with volkov is i just don't think he's as threatening of a striker as a mark hunt or a alistair overeem or a francis Ngannou to to hurt curtis because 
unlike those matchups, I think Curtis has a pretty pronounced speed advantage here. Um, you know, he did say in like the hunt fight too, but like, uh, you know, Francis countered him with a big shot. Obviously Francis is very fast, just a physical freak and everything, but Volkov doesn't, he's got a lot of TKO KO wins on his resume. Yes, but he hasn't really shown to be that one punch KO kind of guy. He goes out at range where he's best. He's technical. He throws a lot of like one-off kicks, but he hasn't really shown that one punch knockout power for heavyweight standards. And so that's why we're seeing Curtis here as such a massive favorite. Basically he should be able to get his grappling going and, and then that should tire Volkov out. But Volkov was noticeably tired in round two against Verdum. It wasn't a big talking point because Verdum was also tired also. And they were just kind of standing at range, not really doing Verdum much. Verdum was exhausted. Verdum was gassed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so it's just a, a matchup where like, yeah, Curtis should just win. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say it. I'm not being bold with that pick or anything, but we're seeing him as just such a big favorite because it's just such a massive advantage that he has here, really. I do think Alexander has some paths, you know, or Volkov has some has some paths of maybe not little resistance. There, let's get one thing straight. There's no path of little resistance against Curtis Blades in the heavyweight division uh, as far as, you know, a path to victory. However, I do think Volkov has some paths, you know, you know, the, the, the disbursement here on this stat shown on the screen, significant strikes landed per minute, you know, over six landed per minute. And obviously what are significant strikes? What are those defined as those are anything that's at range that does not consist of any jab like strikes. So any kicks, any punches landed at an efficient distance count in that meter. And I think that is obviously the way that Volkov is going to have to set up, you know, his, his offensive prowess, Curtis blades. While I do agree with you, the one punch, you know, set it and forget it type of power is, or at least not evident on tape. However, I will give Curtis blades the benefit of the doubt when it comes, I think his counter striking has improved tremendously. The way that he set up that, that overhand, right that stunned Dos Santos off that lead uppercut that Dos Santos kept throwing, I thought was a telling sign that he's improved on the feet. Um, regardless, though, this is going to be a tough matchup for anybody in this division, let alone Alexander Volkov. And as you said, the betting odds did kind of show that. We're talking about the most prolific takedown artist in the history of the heavyweight division at, at a young age, too, if that. That's got to count for something, and clearly it does in, in the lines. Absolutely. Yeah. Curtis has the, the background to back it up and he's just also an excellent MMA wrestler. I mean, every time he gets somebody in the clinch, it's hard for them to separate and he just pretty much drags them down. I mean, it's just a, a rinse and repeat sort of process. We don't see heavyweights have this wrestling heavy type of style off. Often we've seen guys like Kamara Usman and Colby Covington do it, but even, even we're looking at things in, in the grand scope of things, just those guys are, are hard to, to find in the UFC. I mean, nobody really has the cardio, the relentless wrestling, the technical wrestling pedigree to do that over and over again. But Curtis does, and that's why he's just such a, a hard guy to deal with and why we just see a ton of hype on him, and he keeps getting better. Keeps getting better, and let's just say hypothetically before we move on to a cracker of a co-main event at 145 pounds, you know, hypothetically speaking, let's just say, I obviously Volkov wins this fight. He's in a good spot because he has never fought in Ganu. And obviously, Blades, you can't be in a bad spot or a worse spot than you were already in coming off of a win. However, as we kind of touched on earlier, it will get tricky there at the top of the heavyweight ladder with a guy like Curtis Blades, who is also on a tear, but has those two losses to Nganu. What do you see potentially being next for Curtis Blades or what type of confusion could be created by a guy who's on just as significant of a tear as Francis Ngannou outside of obviously when they fought their rematch in, uh, I believe it was in China, uh, a couple, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, you just said it. I, I do think that this is a matchup where Volkov has more to gain from than Curtis does because like you pointed out, Curtis already fought Francis, lost twice convincingly and... Uh, I mean, in my estimation, a, a trilogy is just not – it's just not as compelling when you have one fighter that's already won the previous two bookings convincingly twice. And you also add the fact that Volkov and Ngannou have, have had some back and forth on Twitter, uh, which could hype up the fight, of course. So this is a scenario where I do think that Volkov has more to gain from just because he hasn't fought Francis. And then also, yeah, you got the the, the limbo situation here with – with Stipe being out, but um, like we talked about last car, uh, last show, the that that's being booked here later this summer, so we're going to have some clarity there. And I do think 
there was an interesting headline that I saw that uh, win or lose from either guy there could mean uh, they both are retired and, and walk away, Stipe and, and Cormier. So I think that would be interesting. We'll have to see how sh things shake out. But I think that we need to kind of see how that fight plays out, that trilogy between Stipe and DC, and then we'll get a little bit more clarity. But even that, if, yeah, if Curtis wins here, it, he's still kind of stuck. He's not going to be moving up the rankings theoretically, unless if just something, again, like I said, if one of these, if Stipe and Cormier retire. So couldn't agree more. I do at some point though, and feel like I deserve at some point a steep Amy Ocich versus Curtis blades fight. That sounds like a hell of a good time. Regardless, we move on to 145 pounds in this weekend's co feature. And I'll just come out and say it right away. The number one thing that is going to be jarring to those that may not already realize it is the size difference between these two guys. Look at that five and a half inch reach advantage for the blue corner representative, Mr. Tiger Shulman himself, Shane Burgos. Five, he is training out of Tiger Shulman, correct? I'm not, I'm, I'm not botching that. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Tiger Shulman versus Team Alpha Male, or vice versa, whichever direction you want to point out. Burgos is lone bugaboo in his career, coming to a very talented Calvin Cater, UFC 220. And it has been on a tear himself. He's been finishing a lot of guys that are known for you know their durability. And it seems like that's the direction this fight is going to go. It seems like Josh Emmett has been maybe not counted out, but seen as the underdog in these types of matchups in the past. And he's come out the other side of them uh, with the other fighter on the canvas back up stiff out cold your thoughts on this matchup 145 pounds yeah it's like you alluded to just a banger of a matchup i mean this is as good as it gets i mean for two guys on the rise just in this very good featherweight division yeah emmett's got the 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 one punch ko threat always like he could knock out even durable fighters it's it's crazy like his power was was evident at lightweight and it's even more pronounced at featherweight and so when you have a guy like Shane Burgos, who's incredibly talented, uh, the Tiger Showman camp, I rate all the fighters that come out of there excellently. Super well-rounded, very good technical boxers. There's just really no holes in their game. They're all just like techni good technical fighters overall. The thing with Burgos, and it's obviously a lot of people have pointed this out, is, is the hands. The, the hands are kept low in striking exchanges, and he's in the past shown that he prefers to slip punches with his head. He's got... He relies on his head movement. Shane is very fast. He is a very good striker, counter striker. He's very confident in his, in his movement and speed. And so uh, Emmett could at any point just hurt him with a big punch. We know Emmett is very explosive and athletic, even at uh, where he's at in his career. I believe he's 35 years young, but even then he's still, uh, even at a, a lighter weight class, his, his explosiveness and athleticism are still a threat. So Emmett could at any point end this thing with one big punch, but uh, now that you're on the stats page, we could look at like significant strikes and, and Burgos just fights at the much higher pace. So over the course of, you know, like three rounds here, especially in a smaller cage, I, I do think that while Emmett has shown like good evasive movement on the outside and not like that willing to like, like Burgos just fights against Cater in, in, in Swanson. There was a lot of volume exchange on both sides, whereas Emmett, I don't think will be that willing to do that. Cause he's just, he doesn't have the, he just hasn't shown the cardio to do that for three rounds. He's again, he's just more of like a power threat, a fast switch muscle type of guy. And so Burgos, I still do think with that reach advantage that you said with that size advantage, his takedown defense is as strong as it is. So, and Emmett just doesn't really wrestle that much. Again, he's just relying on his power. So it should, it should be one or lost on the feet. And like I said, Emmett could at any point just one punch and this thing, it's not impossible. Burgos was hurt by Holabaugh in Qatar, but over the course of three rounds, I, it's hard for me to think that if this goes to the de decision or even in like late round three that uh, Burgos potentially gets Emmett tired and because uh, he also goes to the body as well. And Emmett has slowed down in the past. In the decision, I just think that Burgos is going to be outworking him and, and went on points there basically. So just a super high level fight and one where just obviously there's a lot of stake here. I don't think – I think this is a spot though where – I think Emmett has more to lose than Burgos just based off age, but even just from a momentum perspective, they're, they're both riding it. And this is just a super intriguing fight. And one that I'm like many other people are just incredibly looking forward to. Should be a fun fight. Clamoring for it. I think that's a good way to put it. And I'm in the same, I'm in the same boat. Burgos was in trouble against Holabaugh. I'm glad you brought that up too. He's kind of like, 
especially in this equation between he and Emmett, he's definitely the one that's more so to bite down on the mouthpiece and kind of throw throw caution into the wind. Not to say Emmett has never done that because, you know, it kind of felt like he had to do that in round three against Michael Johnson if he was going to get the win in that fight, a fight that I thought he was behind in. Regardless, though, it, I think you highlighted a lot of key points. The activity, or at least the higher level of volume in said activity, is definitely going to come from the side of Shane Burgos. Josh Emmett is going to be more of a finish the fight in one strike type of guy, at least in between both of these guys. And it makes for a fun fight. It makes for a fun matchup. And Burgos obviously will be doing everything right since losing the cater fight, uh, which seems like forever ago at UFC 220. That was January of 2018. And now we at least attempt to move on. Why is this not letting me do what I want it to do? We're trying to move on to the women's bantamweight division as we get it up on the screen here. And both of these girls need a win badly. Raquel Pennington did not look, you know, all too world beating in her last fight against Holly Holm. And neither did Holly. You could make that case, you know, for either side, regardless. What do you have, at least of your early premonitions of this matchup at 135 pounds? Yeah, like you said, both women, despite the fact that they're very proven fighters in this bantamweight weight class, they do need a win for sure. Rocky has lost three of her last four, and the one win that she did get, and it was it was a fight that I did think that she ultimately won. It was still a split decision to a a uh, very talented and on the rise Irina, Irina Aldana. And Marion Renault has lost her last two fights uh, to Yana Kudinsky and Kat Zinganu. And yeah, this is just a, a fight where I think it's just, it's going to be very competitive. Like I favor, I think that Renault has the sharper hands. I think she hits with more power. Not that I'm expecting a knockout or anything, but I right. do tend to favor her in terms of pure boxing. But why we're seeing Pennington as a favorite here is because she's a good enough boxer to be competitive with Renault. And then also Renault's striking just isn't varied. She just doesn't throw kicks. Um, and, and Rocky does. So while this fight's at range, I, I have to favor Rocky just based off the fact that she throws kicks and um, she, she'll she be the more effective striker. And ultimately what gives Rocky the hump in my estimation and why she should be favored here uh, is is the wrestling. And, and she's, again, not the most efficient wrestler that she's shown in recent fights, but again, it's like you said, stout competition. Holly Holm is a, a good overall wrestler. Uh, Jermaine Duraname is a, uh, a solid defensive wrestler as well, Amanda Nunes. She even took Amanda Nunes down once. So this is a more forgiving matchup for Rocky to showcase her wrestling because Renault, that has been the culprit to uh, some of her losses. Like def definitely the Kat Zingano one, it, Zingano very intelligently utilized that to slow her down. And then even even the Sarah McMahon fight, like she she, it's nice to know that she could overcome adversity and, and not get discouraged by... Um, you know, what, like having struggles early on in the fight, but she still was taken down and controlled there. So while Pennington is not as credentialed as a wrestler as Zinganu or uh, McMahon, I do think that she could land takedowns here. And and that's ultimately what should give her the edge. That combined with the, the boxing exchanges being close enough and then also the fact that she should have success kicking range. But even all that said, it's still a competitive fight and one that, again, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy because I think this is, this is going to be a, a telling fight for this division. What would you say, though, to somebody who would be on the comeback to some of the comments that you had, you know, just previously about the wrestling aspect of it? You know, Marion Renault has had success against people that have, you know, kind of had wrestling at the forefront in the past. I mean, she tapped Sarah McMahon and, you know, kind of has the style, at least. I thought she won her last fight against Yana Kunitskaya. Um, you know, neither here nor there. We don't need to turn this into a judges seminar, but regardless... Because we could go on for a while about that. But, you know, regardless, I think Marion Renault presents challenges, you know, stylistically here for Raquel Pennington. I really do. I think that this is not going to be an easy fight for the taking for Rocky but in, in any way, shape, or form. I, I do think you're spot on, though, about the kicks. I think that gives Raquel Pennington kind of an edge that no one is looking at here going into it. She throws kicks at a much higher clip and has been known to do so in the past than Renault. 
And I think that's going to help her out tremendously in this fight too. Does a win really do a whole lot here for either? I mean, a loss certainly puts, you know, one of these two in potential. I This division is weird though, because like there's only what, 18, 19, you know, women's bantamweights on the entire roster. So, you know, a loss doesn't deter you necessarily, but I mean, obviously the all seeing eyes got their eye on it regardless. What do you think could possibly come of a win here? I mean, does winner get maybe, you know, Ketlin Vieira? I, I, what, what, what would you do? Just off yeah. The top of your head. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I think the winner of this fight could get Caitlin. I have to think that Aspen Ladd and Sarah McMahon is going next weekend. And then we have Irene Aldana and Holly Holm fighting for a headliner. Yep. And based off the potential retirement talk of Amanda Nunes and assuming that belt does get vacated, I could see the UFC going, okay, let's see who wins in Ladd versus McMahon. Let's see who wins in Holm versus Aldana. And let's just have the two winners square off and fight for the bantamweight title. Whereas I like your suggestion. I do think that Vieira could fight the winner of this fight. That's a, a matchup she she could win. Um, she's coming off a, a, a tough loss to Irene Aldana, but it's it's one of those fights where like it if the winner of this fight beats Caitlin Vieira, you could say like that two fight winning streak is good, and you could say that they could be next in line for a title shot after that uh, scenario I suggested. Or you have Caitlin Vieira, who is already riding high prior to the Aldana fight, get a good win, and then she's back in the mix to some extent. Maybe not next in line, but again, she's kind of uh, still like a, a compelling player in the weight class, like a top five or something like that. So I like that suggestion. And uh, yeah, I think we got some implications for that, by, for sure. Certainly do. Anytime two fighters in the top 15 are involved. We have a couple of guys at 170 and no shame at all, not being included in the top 15 sample size at 170. We got two guys that are as good as they come outside of that sample size uh, in the second fight of this weekend's main card. Bilal Muhammad and Lyman Good. This has fight of the night potential written all over it, and I don't think that that's breaking news to anyone that's seen either of these guys before. Your thoughts when you saw this pen put to paper, at least for this main card. And the main card opener has some things to say about it as well, but I really like this one they're serving up at Welterweight. Oh, I do too. Yeah, this is a great booking here. I, I really like this fight. It's one where it should it should be a banger, like the the Emmett Burgos fight, I think. I think it has the potential to be a banger because while Muhammad has shown to be a, a very capable wrestler, I tend to think that he's going to struggle to get good down here with consistency. Maybe it goes down kind of along the Tim Means fight where like, yeah, maybe he gets him down once or twice, but really struggles to control him and good can make his way back to his feet. That was something that and understandably so, people thought uh, Ren Counter could take uh, good down. And, and I know Ren Counter didn't really show a lot of urgency to, to get the fight to the ground. It was taking a, a, quite a, a beating at boxing range there. But, uh, you know, it, I think people, and including myself, thought like Chance Ren Counter had a more legitimate chance than he objectively did against good because of the recency bias of Damian Maya taking down and submitting good. But I go back and I look at tape there, and we, we know Maya is like, like jiu-jitsu is number one for him, but his takedown game has come such a long way. And I, I go back on tape, and I'm like, Maya really worked for those takedowns. And those were like – that was like high level. For most stuff. of the time, yeah. For most for – mo for like almost the entire duration, he was working hard for them. I agree, yeah. And, you know, Bilal is definitely capable. He, I'm, not, I'm not saying he's like not a capable wrestler or anything. But I go back and look at some of his fights that he ended up getting to the ground. Like the Curtis Millender one, he struggled kind of early on to get him down. And we saw Millender like just a month prior get taken down and submitted quickly by DeSantos. Um, you know, I'm sure Millender worked on his defensive grappling in the meantime. But again, I just kind of am, am questioning like how much could he have improved in like a month. And then also right. – um, there's been other fights as well, like the Jeff Neal fight. He struggled to get him down. So, like, while Bilal has certainly shown he's a capable wrestler, I tend to think you need to be at, like, a good, a prof very proficient takedown artist to get good to the ground. Now, that said, that'll have a recipe for this fight in that I do think, uh, like, you have the numbers out. They both throw in volume. Uh, they're both basically, like, fearless guys. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen fights like Lyman Good versus Zaleski Dos Santos, and we've seen – Bilal Muhammad versus Tim Means were like, those were fun fights. And I think that that one, this one has potential to be 
uh, fun as well, just due to their, their come forward, uh, you know, volume heavy type of style. Certainly uh, good has more punching power, but Muhammad's so tough and durable. He's been uh, knocked down in the past, but the guy's hard to put away. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see this one go to decision where uh, it, it plays out, you know, in, in a fun way. You know, alignment good is devastating in close quarters. Those shots in the clinch, per particularly the ones that he landed on Ben Saunders and put out Ben Saunders in at, at uh, M MSG, or the ones that stick out in my head, just ruthless. And, you know, I like that you brought up that that Zaleski versus good fight was kind of ahead of its time almost. We see these matchups all the time. Wonder Boy versus Robert Whitaker is a good example where these fights are made so far ahead of, you know, time wherever they would have hit peak popularity. But obviously you can't really predict or foresight those things when you're in the eyes of Sean Shelby and company. Regardless, the takedown aspect of this, or the grappling aspect of this, it, you'd have to wonder what is going to lead below Muhammad to institute like a grapple heavy approach. I think these two are going to stand, stand and trade and until Bill Muhammad is given a reason potentially to bring the fight to the ground. I mean, if someone's going to be the instigator in those types of ground battles, would you say it is going, would you say Muhammad is the likely party of the two? Absolutely. Yeah. Just, you got the numbers in front of us. He's just shown much more willingness to go for the takedowns. And I think that that would be what his camp would want him to, because it's like Lyman good in a striker's battle is, is like a, a serious guy. Not only does he have the power, but he's got, uh, he's very technical, uh, sits down on his punches very well. And the guy's just like a legitimate threat. Yeah. I mean, you look at all of his losses, like we said about Volkov, it's like guys that are, are very good grapplers, Korshkov, Askren, Maya, um, Dos Santos was like a back and forth. So that would kind of be, I think, what Bilal would in a perfect world need to mix in. But like I, I more so see Bilal Muhammad's path to victory playing the role of Zaleski Dos Santos, where he kind of just doesn't get hurt by good over the course of three rounds, but basically outworks him on the feet. There's a lot of potential results that come with that matchup and a lot of potential results that come with this one as well. I really like this fight at 155 pounds to get things going. As you can see, there's a size discrepancy as well here. Roosevelt Roberts having about five inches on Jim Miller. I think this is a perfect fight potentially for Roosevelt Roberts. They, I wouldn't say rushed him into the Vince Pichel booking, but obviously Vince Pichel was someone that appeared to be too much too soon for Roosevelt Roberts at the time, or at least, or maybe it was Vince Pichel's night. Who knows whenever he dropped that fight to him. What do you think, particularly on the timing of this bout? Is this the right time for Roosevelt Roberts to be taking a fight against a guy like Jim Miller? Is, is he ready for this type of matchup, or, or do you have concerns? Yeah, that's always, I guess, the concern in general with these like prospect versus proven veteran type of matchups. Like, yeah, here, where, especially where the prospect hasn't fought like near this level of proven fighter in Jim Miller, that's always going to be something – yeah, that's always going to be something that like could come back like if, if people are on the prospect to win. But this is a matchup where like, yeah, Miller could win. I mean, obviously he's got some stuff left in the tank. To, I, I bet against him uh, when he fought Holtzman. But like I was impressed with how valiantly he fought there. He won the first round. It wasn't like a complete blowout of a fight. And, and um, you know, Holtzman was kind of hunting for the kill shot a little bit but didn't get it. But even then, like – it was uh, the takedown that Holtzman got kind of changed the complexion of that fight. And that's kind of been the, the, the thing with Miller is, is that I'm picking up on is some things that stuck out to me in tape study was he told his corner very famously, I'm sure you've heard between round two and three of the Trinaldo fight. He said, he's got nothing left. I've also heard uh, Trevor Whitman. And obviously I couldn't see it from when, where I'm sitting at watching this on film, but Trevor Whitman told the commentary team when they were checking in with him, in his fight with Holtzman, that he he was under the impression, basically paraphrasing here, that Miller didn't want to get up. I believe it was between rounds two and three, or that he just wasn't um, like as up for it. And so that's going to be the concern with Miller here is like how much does he like want it? It's not like a to me. It's yeah, from a technical level, yeah, for sure he could hang with Roberts, but it's like cardio and it's the fact that Roberts is hungry. I mean, he's the guy that let's just be honest here has much more to gain from this here. That then Miller does. And we just saw him fight, obviously big step of a competition, but this is a matchup where like Miller needs to win this fight early 
or or Roberts probably wins. Uh, but from a technical yeah. level, yeah, Miller's Miller's always game. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And I think these two dudes will both prove to be especially game uh, when they close the door behind them. I, this is also one of those matchups that I selfishly – I'm not calling it Verdum versus Olenek on this scale, but I am saying that, like, let's see what these two dudes got on the on the mat. Let's see these two dudes duke it out on the canvas in an MMA setting. I would love to see who comes out on top in a grappling match between these two guys. Let's just start them out on the ground. We don't need to start them out on the feet. That's how I – like I said, that that's – the outlook I had in Verdum Olenek, obviously on a much, much grander scale, but I would not mind it all if they were like, hey, we're going to modify the rules here just for this particular fight. Start these two dudes on the ground. Let them go ahead and grapple it out. How about that? Yeah, Let's I mean, <laughs> I think that would benefit Miller immensely yeah. here, to be honest. Okay. I think that would, uh, um, you know, because while Roberts, I believe he's a brown belt, he is definitely skilled on the ground and he is improving fight to fight. But some of the things that I noticed on tape looking into his fight against Weaver is uh, I've seen him get his back taken. The Bichelle fight, he got reversed there. Um, so, yeah, while he's he's good on the ground, it's not like he's looked perfect there. Right. And we know. Right. Um, yeah, we know how good M Miller is, even at this stage of his career. Oh, it wasn't yeah. too long ago when he submitted uh, Gonzalez and White. So. Yeah, if it, if it goes there, I think Miller would actually get the edge. Uh, as bold. I as agree that. with you. I agree with you. Roberts just kind of pops on tape, especially in those grappling exchanges. You know, that 10-finger choke or that standing 10-finger kind of guillotine that he had against, uh, I believe it was a Daryl Horcher. That that was particularly impressive. Um, you know, things like that that kind of just pop on tape and make you go, whoa, will kind of draw that ire to some people's eyes. However, I do agree with you as far as the overall advantage is concerned. Um, and in Jim Miller's last fight, he was able to get the better of another veteran by the name of Clay Guida, who finally, even though it seems like this fight's been booked, what, five, six times? Something. Finally <laughs> gonna fight, yeah, it's finally going to fight Bobby Green, who surprisingly is going to have three inches on Clay Guida. You know, last time they booked this fight, I believe it was for Chicago, um, not last summer, but summer before that, I think. Maybe it was last summer. Um, it was for one of the Chicago pay-per-views, and Clay Guida called Bobby Green a coward afterwards. For It had to have been the one that Clay Guida actually fought on and won. I, I, it's, it's leaving me right now as far as which fight it was, but I'm going to fact-check myself as I go ahead and give you the floor for this matchup. Um, first of all, excellent transition. That's one of the best transitions I've ever heard. I mean, you, you had a fighter that we were just talking about in the previous matchup. Yeah. Who somebody who's fighting right, right here. Into it. So I there you made go. It smoother though. I could have made it smoother. I tried it, my hardest. Doesn't get much better than that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, here we uh, go right here. Um, Clay Guida fought at you. It was UFC. It, he lost to Oliveira. Oliveira took the fight and and subbed him by guillotine two eighteen into the first round. That's what that was. I couldn't remember. Yeah, um, it's all good. So like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just a matchup where it's like just so. I mean, even if uh, the argument could certainly be made that Green is the better fighter, but the reality is he's won one time in his last seven bouts. I mean, yes, you know. So it's like. Eh, okay, like, am I am I super confident in him here? Regardless, I think it's a favorable stylistic matchup. You know, those uh, fights against Trinaldo and Close could have gone either way. And um, he's he's a fighter where, like, yeah, from the eye test, Bobby Green is is super talented. He's kind of like he's kind of like his own worst enemy in a way. I mean, he just uh, he he taunts. Uh, he doesn't always put his foot on the gas. He, he just doesn't fight in an optimal way uh, at times, kind of like what uh, like Cody Garbrandt, like from a skill perspective, excellent fighter, uh, but just sometimes he could get in his own way. But when he's on, he's on. And, um, you know, while Bobby Green, I'm not expecting him to make like a title run in this weight class. I, I do tend to think that he has a, a lot left, uh, a lot more left in the tank than, than Guida does, who, um, you know, didn't look, didn't look great against BJ Penn in round one, lost that fight. And I think absorbed it like 64 significant strikes, if memory serves there, and only outlanded, outlanded Penn by like 16. And you, and you couple that with the fact that uh, that fight with Miller was so quick, it was so crazy. He rocked Miller, and then Miller rocked him back when Guido was going in for the finish. 
and then Guido dove in for the uh, takedown, and then Miller just guillotine. yeah caught him in the guillotine. So, so it's one of those things where like, and I understand the argument with uh, Green might just grapple here. I mean, he, I could see him doing it. Um, you know, I saw on Instagram he's he's got his his gi out. He's he's training. I believe he's a purple belt. Um, he, he's skilled on the ground. Is Green? I think he's a good scrambler, uh, good wrestler. Will have some size on on Green or on Guido, like you said. So I tend to think that this is a, a good matchup for Bobby Green. It just again goes back to the he's won one time in his last seven fights. So again, how how confident can I be in in the win here? I mean, not super confident, but I, no. I tend to favor him. Interesting, and that's you know one way that I didn't expect you to go. Just because of that factor, you know, the freshness factor, the activity factor should be interesting to see which one of those guys can get a much needed win. And you want to talk about a much needed win. Tisha Torres needs a win. You know, you blink. She was 10 and one as a, as a fighter and obviously a centerfold in the UFC strawweight division. And now she's, she's staring five losses in a row right in the face against a girl who is tough and very, very skilled in Brianna Van Buren. Yeah, um, I thought what I'm sure you might have thought and what a lot of other people thought before diving into this fight. Yeah. Tisha Torres at underdog odds is live based off like the, the proven thing and, and the level of opposition and all that. But after looking at it on tape, I tend to think Brian Van Buren, who is an excellent prospect, uh, a, a woman that I wrote up, I think she's got a lot of upside. And um She's her striking is coming along technical wise. I do like that she took a couple years or two or three years off, like after one of her losses, and then came back and looked significantly better in Invicta. She's super well rounded. Uh, I believe she's a brown belt in jujitsu, at least. Uh, a good wrestler, strong, throws in volume, has power, uh, good volume, uh, technique, checks out. It's not, again, Yoani and J check level, but it's, again, it's, there's something there. Good athlete. Yeah. Great cardio, took that fight on short notice against Sosa and pushed a heck of a pace, had her hurt at one point, and, and got a 30-27 clear win against a, a good woman. Like I, I yes. really, so you know what I mean? Like, yeah, Sosa's like super good. high on Sosa going into that fight. Yeah. And um it, it just more so speaks to how good uh Brianna is. And so what we have yeah. here is, you know, Torres, obviously, she's always gonna be game. Torres is is durable as they come. She's tough. She'll she'll hang in there with the best of them. But the reality is she needs to win this fight on the feet. It's possible, but I tend to think that Brianna throws uh, is more aggressive and is uh, more more powerful. Not that I'm expecting a knockout, but again, that the threat of powers in advantage. She's going to walk Tisha down for the majority of the duration of this fight, in my opinion. I think she'll be the aggressor. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, technical proficiency wise, they're they're pretty similar. They're both good technical strikers, but the compelling element here is the wrestling. And and yeah. that's what Brianna should do here. She has opportunities, a lot of them to take down Tisha, control her, pass the guard, not expecting a finish, but just earn top control time, perhaps threaten with some ground and pound or a a um a submission, but not actually get it sort of thing. So I understand why Brianna's a solid favorite here. Obviously, she's not as proven as Tisha, but that said it is a fair very favorable style sick matchup for her and one she should win. In the next matchup down the bill, this is a fight between two guys that I'm sure the promotion had higher hopes for amongst signing them. You know, they've really tried. I, I'm going to kind of paraphrase from what my man at MMA Dexter tweeted earlier this week. The UFC really wanted to make Mark Andre Barrio a thing. And I think that that was pretty evident. You know, a two division champion coming into the promotion you know, at 185 and 205 pounds for, you know, a promotion that has, you know, pumped out some somewhat notable fighters into the UFC, i.e. George St. Pierre, but we won't need to, you know, elaborate on that. Regardless, the TKO promotion is what I'm talking about. But, you know, Oscar Pijota coming over as a Cage Warriors middleweight champion gets his gets his feet wet uh, in, a, in a win in his home country and has really struggled since, you know, finished by Gerald Mearshart. He was finished by uh, Puna Soriano. Uh, Barriold, I believe, has been on the wrong end of three decisions. I don't think he's been finished, but they've fought really tough competition, 185 getting better every single day in and day out. I would have to imagine, though, this is winner gets another deal, loser, loser goes home. Am I wrong? Yeah, I tend to agree. Uh, just like what we said about uh, 
Torres, I mean, four in a row, uh, a fifth loss, uh, even though it's against good competition, it's, you know, while, while I would like her to stay in the UFC, I'm not so sure that the UFC would echo it. But yeah, this is, I think, do or die for these guys in terms of staying with the UFC. And it's one where I think it has potential. I mean, Barrio, it's just so hard to like, while I like him here, I do think that this is like actually like a pretty decent matchup here for him and that he should just be able to have the better cardio and uh, basically be durable and, and good enough defensively to withstand whatever Pachota throws at him because Pachota's cardio is shown to be a, a big liability. But at the same time, I thought last matchup was a pretty good stylistic matchup for him against Park. And I thought he was going to out-wrestle and outstruck Park, and he was outstruck and out-wrestled. So it's a it's a matchup where it's like I'm just going to sit back and, and watch and see how it goes. It should be fun. But uh, it should be one where I do think that there's potential to finish. So from a, a viewership perspective, I think this could be a banger. But um, – one where, like you said, we could see these guys just fight with so much more urgency than we're used to. And um, Barrio is kind of that guy, like that Ian Heinish type, where he'll go out in the third round and, and look for that uh, finish, even though he knows he's down. And, and Pichota kind of fights the opposite. So it should be fun and uh, one I'm looking forward to. I think it kind of speaks to the power of this 185 pound division a little bit that these two have had, you know, kind of tumultuous paths and have dealt with adversity or at least you know, each in their own right. I think it kind of speaks maybe less to these guys' transgressions, but more so to the depth that 185 really has. It's not obviously as populated as 170 and 155 and what have you, but I mean, it, it, it's showing some depth. And I think this is a testament with these guys having the recent runs that they've had. Yeah, it's uh, it's always a shark tank in the UFC, but uh, yeah, I hopefully, really yeah, hopefully uh, we see uh perhaps an improved performance by other guy that they can hopefully implement going forward to stay with the company. Yeah. And unfortunately for one of these guys, I do believe that the loser will get said walking papers um, from the company. Is Courtney Casey a one twenty er I guess we might find out the answer on Saturday when she takes on Jillian, the Savage Robertson. This should be a fun one. If this one hits the mat as well, my friend, do you agree? I agree. Um, I could see this going kind of like Casey's fight against Watterson where like she's threatening from bottom. Obviously Casey just showed her last fight that she's got a very threatening guard um, and she's, she's difficult to advance on it. And something's got to give here because Robertson's kind of like, she takes you down and it advances on you and looks for the finish. And so uh, I see it kind of going like Casey's fight against. It's going to be a competitive fight, but do the judges favor the top control of Robertson? Or are they going to favor the the threat from bottom of Casey, if, assuming she doesn't finish the fight, uh, to be significant enough to win the bout? Now, that said, we have another dynamic here. The striking, I think, is is pretty pronounced in favor of Casey, uh, like you have right here. Longer reach, uh, throws with more volume. I just think is a much more comfortable striker. She's not like shown to be like the most dangerous striker, but again, she does throw down. She's uh, She gets in there. She's aggressive. And she's uh, struck with women like Angela Hill over the course of three rounds. So she's very capable there. And um, it's it's going to be one of those fights. It's going to be competitive, but uh, it's going to be one of those, if, assuming Casey does not get a finish here, because I tend to think she's the party more likely of the two to finish, that it's going to be basically yeah. in the eyes of the judges. What's more important, top control or Casey's threat from bottom? Top control, obviously. No doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you think so. Not, not everybody thinks that, but uh, right. I tend to favor that too. Yeah. You'd have to favor it, but that's what, I like I said, we could get into a seminar about judging all we want. On the feet, how how long do you think this fight plays out on the feet? Do you th I, I think they're going to go straight straight into close quarters action, but, you know, I, I am no genie. No, I, I am think a wizard. I think you're right. I think Jillian, she's shown urgency. I think she'll look to get the fight to the ground right away. Not like in a reckless sort of way. Again, yeah. she's improving that. But uh, it the thing that I noticed on tape is that I don't know that Casey needs like extended periods of time to, to potentially even finish this fight because uh, I just think she's the much more comfortable striker and could just potentially just be a little bit too much in terms of volume and, and, and pace and pressure. So yeah. – yeah, it might not play out on the feet for too long, but it might not like need to, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I got gotcha. you. Totally. Interesting that they put that fight higher than, you know, another one that's at 125 and a lot higher up in the rankings that we'll get to in just a moment. We're kind of getting to the end here 
Uh, supposed to be what I'm sure all violence lovers. And hey, look, for a second, we do have Matt Frivola and Frank Camacho on the screen. Um, however, that is incorrect. Matt Frivola's corner getting a little bit of the corona life, testing positive. I apologize for the insensitivity that that comment may bring. Regardless, though, and we do wish here from the bottom line that anybody affected in that does make a full recovery. Regardless, Justin Guitar Hero James steps in to fight Frank Camacho in absence of Matt Frivola. I, how much of Justin have you watched? I've heard of him. I have I have heard of him whenever I saw that the booking was made. I made the I connected the dots in my head. I will say though, I believe this is one of the first instances where you and I have been on the airwaves where I cannot say that I have watched actually sat down and watched tape. I think this might be the first guy. Uh, it's funny you say that because actually before getting on here with you, I was only watching about a couple minutes of, of Justin's fight film and I, there wasn't too much to take away uh, making this debut. Four on fight win streak, all four finishes in the first round. Um, he's coming out of WXT, which is the same promotion that you just saw Anthony Ivy debut out of in Michigan. Well, I mean, I Ivy only had one fight under that promotion, but they are based out of Michigan. Yeah, um, and actually, as we're talking here, I noticed that they have odds out. Uh, they just released them. Frank Camacho, I'm looking yeah. at five times. Yeah, minus 380, which is interesting. Okay, I'll have to look at that. But uh, seeing minus, him as a big, Wait, minus what? Say that again? Uh, 380. 380. Interesting. 380. Yeah, because Camacho, while he's got a fan-friendly style, like defensively, he's, he's shown some liabilities for sure. He doesn't uh, have a minus 380 style. You agree with that? I don't think he's got a minus 380 style. Yeah, because unless if he just overwhelms the opposition with volume and cardio like he did against Nick Heim, he, he tends to fight uh, competitively, even the fight yeah. against Damian Brown. So I'll have to look at this one. Uh, man, I, I got to look at this guy. But uh, this, the, I don't want to go back in time here, but the Frivola one would have been interesting because we had yes. the speed dynamic of Frivola and the wrestling threat and the cardio. Um, and then we had like the, the the technical striking, the volume of Camacho. So that would have been interesting to see how that one played out because while uh, from a technical level, Camacho was better, football was a lot faster. So I need to see a little bit more of this guy, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, these are tough circumstances, as is uh, another gentleman that we'll get to later. So see how yeah. that takes out. 100%. And we'll barrel through it with the, with the aforementioned fight at 125 pounds. An interesting placement, just being the second fight up on the entire bill. However, you would have to imagine the winner of this fight is in a pretty enviable position at 125 pounds. Number six and number seven, respectively, between Roxanne Modafferi and Lauren Murphy. And as I said, you know, this could kind of parlay for one of these lucky participants. No pun intended, being that that is Lauren Murphy's nickname. Um, that the lucky winner in this fight does propel themselves into maybe rarefied air they have not been at in a, I don't count Roxanne's immediate title shot by the way but that is kind of what's at stake here between whoever comes out of this fight as the winner in a division that is definitely in need of the constant feature of one Valentina Shevchenko yeah um, I'm kind of surprised that these two women didn't cross paths on like tough or something because uh, again they they were standouts on that show, even though Murphy lost early on. She lost to the champ, Nico Montano. But, uh, yeah, like you said, there's some implications here. An interesting fight. They're both coming off very good wins where they were big underdogs. In. And uh, regardless of the circumstances, I know that the, the decision with Murphy, uh, with Lee, was uh, really competitive. Regardless, the fact that she went out there and was competitive with a fighter like Andrea Lee tells me that she's uh, game. Absolutely. And Mata Ferry, uh, even though Barbara got hurt, I mean, from what I saw on tape, uh, you know, not 100% sure when that injury happened, but Barber seemed to get yeah. hurt in round two, not round one when Roxanne mm -hmm. already took her down. I'm so, glad you brought that up. I was going to ask you, do you detract from Roxanne after that performance, given the circumstances, or do you give her credit? I like, give what her, do you lean towards? I give her credit because when she does get her grappling going, she's shown to be a real threat, like just Antonina as well. She showed that she's a threat there too, but it's when – um she doesn't get women to the ground and is at a striking disadvantage like a Jennifer Maya type. 
those are the fights where she struggles in the most. So this is a completely different matchup for her. One where I do think she could land takedowns here. Now will it be enough? Um, like the other women's fight that we talked about, uh, Renault and, and uh, Rocky. I think this will be competitive, but one that I, like you, yourself, has implications here for this weight class and uh, should be a fun fight. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I agree. And definitely does have implications for the upper half, or at least in that division. And in what was supposed to be, remind me, man, it was Austin Hubbard. And who was he supposed to fight originally? It was, I've got it right here. It so was Joe Kalecki. Yeah. And so now enters in kind of wonder kid. And I'm going to probably botch his name. Max Ro Roskopf. Roskopf. Do you know if that is proper pronunciation? Roskopf? I've heard it pronounced a couple ways, but we'll go with that. That's reasonable. Enough. There's no way to be sure is what you're saying. I, you know, I actually looked it up online, like pronunciation and like Google did not even give me a legitimate answer. So yeah. we'll just go with that. <laughs> five and oh, as a pro, all five wins coming in by the same virtue, that being of submission Four of them in round one, including his last four in a row. Um, couple of rear naked chokes. This one right here on Tapology and Jonathan Morris just says choke, but we have three rear nakeds and Anaconda, and then the one that's just, I, I guess, categorized as choke. I, I would have to see that on film to know where that goes. However, clearly a submission specialist and, you know, Austin Hubbard just keeps getting thrown these serious curveballs. Yeah, uh, he gets another excellent grappler here. He We saw him face Davi Hamos, an ADCC uh, pedigree oh, type and, of guy. And Marco Madsen, too. Like, Christ. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. It, it honestly doesn't get that much tougher in terms of, like, like – credentialed grapplers and then he gets another guy here who max has got a lot of hype on him rightfully so guys very young division one all-american wrestler and it's it's always nice to see that combo and we it's so rare in this game where you have the excellent wrestling but then you also have the excellent jujitsu like a chris weidman type um because it, it's just a legitimate threat you could get the fight to the ground easily against the vast majority of the opposition and then you could finish the fight right. and so that's what we see here with max but we obviously have some curveballs uh with with max here these are tough circumstances kind of like adashev last week not to say that it's the same thing that's going to happen here but this is a guy yeah. that's taking this like you said with selecki taking it in about a week's notice this is his ufc debut he has not fought nearly the level of opposition hubbard has and he hasn't been past the three minute 11 second mark of the second round so while i do like max and i do think he has upside these are very, very difficult circumstances with that said i'm not going to write him off here if he loses but this is just one where i do think we'll learn a lot of insight about max here as to how how his future kind of unfolds. Assuming he looks great, he'll have potentially even more upside than I think initially. Yeah. But even if he loses, I still, he's not going to be a guy that I'm going to write off. Love is right. still. Of course. And UFC debutants, at least in the past, have proven to kind of shake off said, you know, stench from their debut. A guy you brought up earlier, a good example, uh, being Charles Jourdain. I think he's obviously looked tremendous in comparison to how he looked in what were difficult circumstances in his debut uh, against Desmond Green in what was basically Desmond Green's hometown last summer. It, it, it's you know neither here nor there, but kind of the same scenario that you can kind of plug and chug in a lot of these guys who make their debuts on kind of less than ideal circumstances and uh, should be an interesting one to play out. My man, AJ, once again, thank you very much for joining me. Um, that will wrap up episode 72 of the bottom line hopefully episode 73 and 74 will be next week 74 will be with the man uh directly to my left that will be to preview poirier and hooker you know i'm gonna ask you real quick before we get out of here are is are we confirmed that 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 fight's a go i believe that that fight's been confirmed to be a go at this point right because poirier and hooker i know that there was like lingering that there was lingering some sort of lingering out there in the proverbial thought process that there was some sort of visa issue going on with hooker. Am I crazy? Did I, am I dreaming that? Or I, I think, I think we're still good to go. I think we're good to go. I didn't see anything on that. Uh, it's interesting. I'll, I'll look out for that, but I didn't see anything. I, I think we're a go. I hope we're a go. Cause that's a fun yeah. fight, but uh, man, that would devastate that card too. 
Uh, then it would be like Lad McMahon would be that main event, at least at that point, I believe. Not yeah. Gall, not Gall and Perry, but you know, we'll never know. We'll break down that card next week and have more to talk about from this weekend. And obviously, as indicated as well, if you like content like this, please do like, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, whatever may have you. This has been episode 72 of The Bottom Line. My man, AJ, thank you once again. I appreciate you very much. Thank you, Davidson. Peace out, guys. Yes, sir. Peace out, guys. We'll see you next week.